I think it's uh, already time to start. Um, well, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining this, uh, this webinar today. Um, this is the first webinar that we are organizing together with the University of Bern and the IEC Europe chapter uh, about climate change and health. Um, today, we are going to touch a topic that, in a way, I think is uh, currently very much of interest in our field that we, uh, it's about attributing health impacts to climate change. Uh, today we have a, a wonderful panel of speakers touching different topics within the, let's say, within the same uh, research field. And I hope that all of you, you can, uh, um, let's say, enjoy this, uh, this webinar. Um, sorry that I'm still admitting everybody in there. Um, just some housekeeping issues for for the webinar please keep your microphone and your video off during the the whole session until we we start with the q a part the the idea is that i will uh, first introduce the speakers and i will run as a, you should you see you will see in a, in a few minutes a kind of um let's say survey to have an idea about who are you from and uh, your work and then uh, each speaker will give a presentation and at the end of the session uh, we will have a Q&A uh, part. The idea is that we will use Slido for managing the first the survey and the Q&A session. For Slido, I will put now in the chat a link that all of you can access in. You will see that there's a, um, an option um, in which you can have first the polls in which I will run the different uh, the survey now in a sec and then on the other part you have the Q&A session the Q&A section basically and the idea is that during the presentation you can put in there the different questions please um, cite the, the name of the speaker so we know which question is addressed to who, whoever in the in the panel and um, and at the end, we will. The plan is that I mean, the idea is that each speaker, each attendee, can let's say vote the different questions. And so eventually, the questions that are more, most let's say, more voted, we can then um, uh, give it to the to the uh, panelists to to start with the with the discussion. Okay. So uh, as I said, if you have any problem, just put it in the chat. But again, the questions just use Slido. Okay. So let me. I have more people here. So I will stop sharing for a sec, and I will start um, with this, um, uh, let's say, uh, poll. So if you go, just give me uh, one second. I will see if I can share my screen as well. Sorry about this. Share now. If we go in here, there are already people that are, let's say, uh, um, responding to this to this uh, poll. That is, uh, we, in which country are you right now? We see that there's more people in uh, Switzerland, United States, UK, which is very good. Already twenty nine people. Wonderful. Let's see people from. Mexico, from Panama, Kuwait, Greece. Very good. I must say that I'm. Um, I, I would like to thank all of you that, in a way, we had a very good response because we received around 200 registrations, which I think it's is very good, and I think it's a good um, sign that the the topic, of course, is is very much of interest. Um. Okay. I think that we can go to the next one. So could you please uh, put what is your field of work within all these different options? OK, I see that it's mostly public health and epidemiology for the moment. Climate science. OK. Excellent. So around, I would say that a majority, it's, uh, let's say, on public health and epidemiology, which is very good. I hope, I mean, I still see people that are joining the, 
the, um, the session. So we will see at the end how many people are. So yeah, in total, we are nearly 100 people, which is very good. So yeah, I think that we can finish here. Let me, as I said, if you want for the, the um, different uh, questions that you would like to, to put to the audience, to the, to the speakers, just use the Q&A session, okay? The Q&A section in the same link. Again, if you have any problem, please let me know in the chat in private or, or for general. So as I said, I'm, I'm gonna give a very brief introduction to the topic and then I will give the word to the, to the speakers. So, uh, well, we know that climate change is considered nowadays the most important environmental threat of our era. It is already impacting human health and, and, and it's expected that this, let's say, climate sensitive health risks will amplify over the coming decades as global warming processes. Um, current literature showed that uh, increased risk in climate sensitive health factors can be associated to extreme weather events. However, it's still unclear how much of these observed impacts can be actually attributed to climate change. This is exactly what the detection and attribution studies uh, do. The idea is that these studies are in a way quite common in, in climate science disciplines, but I would say that are almost neglected in, a, in current epidemiological literature. And we, we should think that understanding the extent to which these changes in a historical health impacts can be attributed to human-made climate change is a key public health question and of great interest nowadays. So uh, just thinking that this evidence that we can, can obtain from these kind of studies is uh, extremely valuable for, let's say, to support evidence-based risk management and advocacy to reduce future climate change impacts. So basically in this webinar, what we try to, to give is a kind of overview on this topic, give a, a more deep, let's say, um, 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 view over the specific topic of on health and of course the link to, to potential let's say uh, um, um, implications for in um, in law and this is exactly what our three speakers are gonna address today so um let's say that the first uh, the first one to start today is uh, is freddie otto she is an associate director of the environmental change institute of the university of oxford in the uk and an associate professor in the global climate science program her main research interest is on uh, extreme weather events and understanding whether and to what extent these are more these these are made more likely or intense due to climate change. She leads several projects understanding the impact of man-made climate change on natural and social systems, with a particular focus on Africa and India. Freddy is the co-lead of the World Weather Attribution, an international effort to analyze and communicate the possible influence of climate change on extreme weather events, hosted at the Environmental Change Institute, her institution. So um, please, Freddy, it's your, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the screen is mine, then let's, let me share it. Okay, so I hope you can see my screen now. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for the invitation and um, hello from a very, very grim, gray, rainy Oxford today. Um, I will give a brief overview, not about health, but about um, what attribution means from a climate science perspective and in particular the attribution of uh, extreme weather events. But before I come to extreme weather events, I would like to start with uh, what is probably the most central attribution um, study that is constantly, repeatedly done in climate science, and that is the attribution of global mean temperature. And I would like to use this as basically an introduction of what, what attribution means. So what you see here on this slide is um, in, in, uh, yeah, a, a figure that I'm sure all of you have seen in one form or another, and it is um, the global mean temperature estimates or observations 
from 1850 onwards until uh, in this case until April uh, 2020 uh, and all the all the black dots are uh, observations um, connected with the black wiggly line and um, what we want to do when we do attribution is basically we want to explain what we observe with the known drivers of changes in the climate system and in order to do that we need to simulate using climate models and for global mean temperatures it really doesn't matter what kind of climate model you use you get the same results basically um, no matter which model you use we need to use climate models to simulate the climate system response in terms of global in, in expressed in global mean temperature for known drivers of climate change and that is exactly what what we do here or what you can see here so we know that global mean temperatures on earth are influenced by changes in the incoming solar radiation by things like volcanic eruptions and also by changes in uh, greenhouse gases and other parts other um, other part, uh, other parts of the um, other other aspects of the the atmospheric composition, like aerosols, for example, and we know the emissions very well, and we know the changes in the incoming solar radiation. We can measure that using observations. What we cannot measure is the climate system response to individual drivers, because of course we only measure. The response to all the drivers combined. So this is why we need to use models. And what we can see on this gra uh, graph, the blue line is the simulated climate system response in terms of global mean temperature to all the known natural climate drivers. So that is the incoming solar radiation, volcanic eruptions, other um, natural emissions from from dust and so on and you can see that this blue line does get in particular at the beginning of the time series does get some of the troughs and peaks that we see in the observed time series but you also see that it does not get um, the strong increase in global mean temperature that we observe um, at the latest since the 1950s and you can you can see it's by eye here. So what we then also did is um, to simulate the climate system's response to the human drivers that we know, so which is mainly greenhouse gas emissions, and the climate system response to that in global mean temperature. And the orange curve that you can see here is what comes out of that. And you can see that this curve very nicely tracks um, the observed increase, but you do not get um, the, the, the variability in it, that, that we have in the observations. And so if we combine the two, then you get, we end up with what is here shown as the red curve, and that is um, the combined response of natural and anthropogenic drivers um, that we get as a climate system response. And because we can only get this when we include the human induced warming and in particular basically 100% of the increase that we observe is because of the human induced warming we can attribute this warming um, to man-made climate change so to greenhouse gas emissions emissions from the burning of fossil fuels so this has been done for decades and every every year every month we do this um this this number that is here in april it was 1.15 um celsius of warming is attributable to human induced um, climate change um so every year that gets a bit higher um but the methods and the technique have not changed uh for for decades um and we can also do this kind of assessment for increases in um, in continental temperature changes, but of course, this is really global mean temperature is a good 
indicator of climate change, but it is not how we experience climate change and how climate change manifests in terms of the impacts. Global mean temperature doesn't kill anyone. So when we are interested in how climate change manifests and what these change in temperature actually means on the scales where, where people live and, um, and, and experience weather and climate, then we need to look into how climate change affects weather. And nowadays, whenever there is an extreme event happening or an event that has, that has strong impacts, immediately the question is, is this climate change or not? And this question doesn't have a yes or no answer um, because ultimately every extreme weather event or every weather event, extreme or not, is always a cult combination of many different causes. But what we can do now and what we could, what for a long time was not possible, but has been increasingly possible in particular in the last decade, is that we can assess how man-made climate change alters the likelihood of an extreme weather event to occur. So what does that mean in, um, in practice? So while we always have multiple drivers uh, of an extreme weather event, there's always a role of just the natural chaotic variability of the weather. It always plays a role whether the weather system happens over a city or, or over a forest and land use changes um, and, and so on play, play an important role. But human-induced climate change can alter the likelihood of an extreme event to occur. And that means in order to find out whether that has happened and to what extent, we need to know what is possible weather in the world we live in today. And again, when we look at the observations, we can see the actual weather in the world we live in today. But from observations alone, we don't give the, get the possible weather because we only get the weather that has actually happened, but not all the types of it, weather that would have been possible um, in the same climatic conditions. So again, we need to use models to simulate possible weather in the world that might have been, uh, in the world that we live in today with climate change. And in this schematic here, you then get a distribution of possible weather events um, that might, can look like this red curve. And when you are, say, interested in a heat wave, you know that um, after three days of uh, average temperatures above 35 degrees in the region where you live in, you really have strong health impacts. So you use that measure, this way of defining heat wave as uh, an indicator for the weather event you're interested in. And so you simulate possible three day maximum temperatures in say you're interested in heat waves in the UK, in the UK, in the world today. And then you get a likelihood for the event that you have that 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 is above 35 degrees, um, and it might be a one in 10 year event in the world we live in today. But then, of course, we need to compare this to what is possible weather in the world that might have been without human induced climate change. And again, because we know very well how many greenhouse gases have been emitted since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. We can take these out of the climate, uh, of the climate model's atmospheres and simulate possible weather in the world that might have been without anthropogenic climate change. And in this schematic, you then might get a very different distribution of possible weather in the world that might have been without climate change. And so for your heat wave that you're interested in, you might find that in the world without climate change, it would have been a one in a hundred year event. And because you know that the only difference in these two worlds where you have looked at the possible weather is climate change, you can attribute the difference to a human induced climate change. And um, in theory, this is pretty straightforward. You simulate possible weather in the world today, you simulate possible weather in the world that might have been, compare the two, and you know, um, have your attributable signal of climate change in the weather event you're interested in. And just as an example, um, so 
one study that we've done this year um, was um, the extreme heat um, happening and um, yeah, occurring in large parts of Siberia earlier this year, where we found that this type of extreme heat would have been almost impossible without human-induced climate change. So the distribution of possible heat in the world with climate change is completely different to the one without climate change. But this is, not all results look like this. So in another study that we've done a few years ago on a drought in Brazil, we found that um, climate change did not play a role in the likelihood of this event to occur, um, but that other factors like population increase and water usage have made a drought that was not very extreme to start with. It was about a one in 10 year event, but it would also have been a one, about a one in 10 year event without climate change. But in the last decade, the water consumption in the area has increased dramatically and that led to impacts that were much larger than a very similar drought had caused uh, at the beginning of the 21st century. So these kind of studies um, have been introduced, well it has first been suggested in 2003 and then there were a few studies um, in the years following that but really, since 2012, there has been a strong increase in these kind of studies and in, an increasing number of researchers across, across the world is looking at an increasing number of different types of extreme events. And here is um, an overview that the climate and, news, uh, and energy news outlet Carbon Brief has put together. Well, they have put all the studies that have been done um, on a map and you can see that all the um, studies in the red uh, bubbles are studies where it was found that climate change has made has played uh, a significant role in the extreme event whereas the blue ones are examples of events where climate change has not been found to play a significant role and the gray ones are the ones where the results were inconclusive and so on the one hand, this shows that there are always a priori four different outcomes for an attribution study. So an event could have been made more likely, it could have been made less likely, it could have been that the event likelihood has not changed, or it can be that with the present tools and understanding and observations and models that we have available, we can't tell. What this map also is uh, showing is that our knowledge uh, of um, extreme weather events and the role climate change plays in them is very unevenly distributed across the globe. So there are lots and lots of studies in Europe, in North America, and also in Australia, but much fewer studies in the rest of the world. And when you look at this study, it also might seem as if most events that have happened have actually been made worse because of climate change. But of course, these are totally not representative. These are, this is a map not of the extreme events that have happened, but of the events where studies have been, attribution studies have been done. And these studies are done in um, the parts of the world where the scientists live and on the events that are relatively straightforward to attribute because we have good data and good models to do this. Um, and so there is an overrepresentation of heat waves. And of course, it is very difficult to publish a study when your result is, we don't know, because our data and our models is not good. Usually these, these results get not out in the published literature, so they are not represented here. And I have tried um, to put, uh, sort of to, to map or to show or to illustrate how much we do know of the role of climate change in recent extreme weather events. And so what is on this map here is in red, every red circle 
um, is a representation of the death associated with extreme weather events that have happened since 2003 in, um, in, in different countries. And so um, the circles are always on the capital of the country. And on the larger the circle, the more death have, been, has, have occurred because of extreme weather events. And um, on top of that, I have plotted in black um, the circles of those deaths for which we know the role of climate change. And you see that, for example, over Moscow, there's a big black circle, almost as large as the red circle. And that is because most of the deaths from extreme weather events in Russia have happened because of extreme heat waves. Um, and they have been studied a lot. And so we, we know there the role of climate change associated with these deaths. But in a lot of other parts of the world, um, you see that there's not a single study on, um, on even one of the extreme events that have happened. And so we have a huge knowledge gap in terms of the role of climate change for a lot of extreme weather events that have happened in particular in developing countries. And um, I think I will close here. Um, and yeah, I hope um, that it was okay as an overview and looking forward to your questions. Excellent, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Freddie. Um, I think that we can go to the second talk and then have the questions at the end, if it's, if it's fine with you. Um, let me then introduce the next uh, uh, speaker. You, it's Chris Ibai, he's a professor in the Center of Health and the Global Environment. Uh, she has been, sorry, that was a, oops, no. Um, she has been conducting research and practice on the health risk of climate variability and change for nearly 25 years, focusing on understanding sources of vulnerability, estimating current impacts and future health risks, designing adaptation policies and measures to reduce the risk of climate change in multi stressor environments, and estimating the health co benefits of mitigation policies. She has supported multiple countries in Central America, Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific in assessing their vulnerability and implementing adaptation measures. And she has been an author on multiple national and international climate change assessments, including the IPCC reports. So um, yeah, Chris, I think it's now your, your turn. And again, thanks a lot for, for participating in this, in this webinar today. Thank you, Anna, and thank you so much for organizing this. I really appreciate the time and effort you put into making this happen. I want to thank Freddie for that excellent discussion about what detection and attribution means from the climate side. For those of you who have not seen, Freddie's got a brand new book, a fascinating book on angry weather. I highly recommend everybody to see it, to see it, to read it. And with that, I'm going to show you some slides around how to apply detection and attribution to health, hopefully to catalyze some interest and to get more studies published because, as mentioned in the beginning, we have a dearth of studies in this area. I wanted to start with why does it matter? Why do we want to do detection and attribution for health? There's lots of statements about the extent to which health could be a risk in the future, and really understanding the magnitude and pattern of that risk requires that we have a baseline from which we start. How do we know that climate change is affecting our health right now? And how can we use that baseline then to, as we move forward, look, for example, at the effectiveness of adaptation? We can use detection and attribution to inform evidence-based risk management. And this is particularly important in, within the context of multiple drivers of climate-sensitive health outcomes that we well know in the health sector when you think of issues like cigarette smoking, that there's lots of health outcomes that are affected. But just like with tobacco smoke, when we look at the climate sensitive health outcomes, they're affected by lots of factors other than weather and climate. And we need to understand the relative importance so we can inform decisions on the allocation of resources, both human and financial resources. Detection attribution matters for policies. 
as the decision makers now are taking climate change up much more seriously than they did in the past to make sure that we're focusing on urgent and immediate needs, but we also have plans for the medium and for the long term. And finally, detection and attribution is critical under international negotiations. It can inform two particular aspects of the negotiations going on at the moment. One is around the investment needs for health adaptation and for mitigation in the health sector. And the second is under loss and damage. And you'll hear not exactly on loss and damage, but when we talk about the legal issues, you'll get a sense of the importance of detection and attribution. We do have a lot of information needs to do detection and attribution studies. As you understood from Freddie's talk, there is a lot of information that's needed on the climate side. Similarly, on the health side, there's a lot that needs to be known. We need to start with our causal pathway. How do we get from the exposure that we're thinking about to the health outcome? We need the piece from the climate community on detection attribution when we're looking at the hazard of interest. That's not our area of expertise. We really need partnerships there to make sure that that piece is done in a robust manner that is reliable. One of the questions implied in what Freddie was talking about is what is our spatial and temporal scale of analyses? As she mentioned, depending on what you choose for your spatial and temporal scale will change your detection and attribution. We need to get from the climate community an estimate of anthropogenic climate change and the extent to which it's affected a particular parameter of the exposure, the severity, the frequency, the duration. And depending on which of those you focus on, you can get slightly different results for your detection and attribution. For us in health, as we're starting into this field of research, starting with event attribution is going to be the most straightforward. I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Once we have the pieces done around the detection and attribution around the climate and what we are going to choose in terms of where we're going to focus on health, we need the data to estimate the risk to health. And that's a really big challenge. There's lots of issues we're very concerned about where climate change is likely already affecting our health and well being, but we need to have the data on the health side, for example, mental health. We don't have very good data for that. And then we need a framework to determine the attribution of the health impacts to the event. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. I'll use heat waves as one of my examples. There was a month long heat wave in July of 2018 in Japan. It was a national emergency. There was tens of thousands of people hospitalized. There were more than a thousand deaths. And according to one attribution study, there was roughly a 20% probability of that event occurring in, in a world without anthropogenic climate change. So you can say, of course, that this is a highly unlikely event. But then when it comes to the health part, if the event had a 20% probability of occurring today um, in a world compared with a world with zero probability of anthropogenic climate change, then what proportion of those deaths, what proportion of the hospitalizations can you say are due to climate change? There's not been a consensus in health studies on how we go about doing that. It seems inappropriate to say that we'll just say 20% of the deaths are due to climate change. We can look at the probability density function of the temperatures and just take temperatures over a threshold, as Freddie showed in one of her slides. There are several different ways we can go about doing the health attribution piece. And it is an area where we do need more discussion within our sector and reach a consensus on how exactly we're going to approach that attribution. <laughs> I think somebody needs to go on mute. Anna, can you mute somebody? Thank you. I'm going to go on to a second example. It's on vector borne diseases. It's more complicated because there's so many drivers of vector borne diseases. 
and I'm going to focus on Lyme disease emergence in Canada. And this is a situation taking advantage of a disease changing its geographic range quite significantly. Climate change can impact Lyme disease risk at three levels. As you can see, it can affect the distribution and the abundance of the ticks. It can affect the transmission cycle and it can affect the likelihood of transmission to humans. So we have three different impact pathways. There is surveillance in Canada. So there is a demonstration, in fact, that the tick and the disease have changed their range in both latitude and altitude. And that really made this study possible. So there's the ticks. As you know, those of you who work in health, Lyme disease has a very complicated two-year life cycle. But when you look at what could happen with a change in climate based on extensive research in Canada, that it boils down to temperature. You need to get the tick from one place to another, and then the place where it comes to needs to be warm enough that the tick can survive, that it has the appropriate hosts. The distribution of the ticks and the disease collected, well, the, the ticks collected in passive surveillance, and then, of course, of the cases associated with the ticks has significantly, as I said, increased its range in Canada. And you can see that the number of places where you have the established populations of these ticks has increased dramatically since the 1990s. The time to establishment has decreased as the temperatures have gone up and as rainfall patterns have changed. Rainfall is less important than temperature. Temperature is very important to the establishment of these populations in Canada. And then at the same time, minimum and maximum temperatures have gone up in Canada. This is a two-step attribution process. I've shown you the climate piece at the end, but it's based on knowing that there's been a change in temperature and then looking separately at what has happened with the disease, with the distribution of the ticks, and then looking at the association between those two. And so one can say with confidence that the emergence of the tick populations in these regions were subsequent to warming, which was due to anthropogenic climate change. And this shows you then the risk maps for Lyme disease from 1971 to 2000, projections for about mid-century and towards the end of the century, and showing that the detection and attribution has been done. And there's confidence then that as the disease continues to spread, that those cases can be attributable to climate change. I want to give a third example. It's, a, it's been an interesting example to work on. I'll show you at the end, there's a publication coming out at, next week on detection and attribution for health in the journal Health Affairs. And one of the examples we wanted to put in was something where it's very difficult to get the health data. And we wanted to show that it's important to do detection and attribution essentially everywhere, that the numbers may be small, but they can be really important for the communities that we are focusing on. And so this example is for ice roads in the Arctic. In Western Alaska, the Arctic has warmed two to three times faster than the global average. With the extreme weather events, we're also seeing shifting migration patterns shorter and warmer winters that are affecting food security, they're affecting infrastructure. When you look at Western Alaska, there's a general dependence on these ice roads for intercommunity transportation, for hunting and fishing, for coastal buffering from storms, for ecosystem services. 2017, 2018 was unusually warm, resulting in extremely low sea ice coverage for the Bering Sea. It was the lowest on record and the lowest in reconstructed history. In December of 2017, there was a flyover of the travel corridor, suggesting the number of open water holes was unaccountable. 
they just uncountable. They could not figure out how many there were. There were just so many that they could see when they did the flyover. There's been very little data that we would normally use in health studies on the health impacts. There are reports of hunters going out. They often go out hunting on uh, vehicles and the vehicles are falling through the ice. The ice is too thin. There are reports of people then dying in boating accidents when there's such thin ice. We don't really have good numbers on this. And so this is extending detection and attribution into the community level and thinking about what is important for the community to understand how can we quantify the kinds of consequences people are likely to see in their day-to-day -day lives. It's, we typically focus where we can get the larger numbers, where we can see the biggest impact, but the small impacts can be incredibly important in these particular communities. Next steps, there's lots of work that we need to do to really move this forward as a field. As I've mentioned a couple of times, we need to start with partnering with climatologists to make sure that we have the appropriate detection and attribution. We have those discussions on what events to focus on. We have the discussions on, should we focus on the severity of the event, on the frequency of the event, the duration of the event. We then need to find the health data. We need to figure out what baseline is gonna be appropriate for analysis. We know that health outcome data change from year to year, dramatically changing this year, and how do we look at our baseline against which we're going to compare. We need a data series long enough to determine the trends. We need to determine if the weather trend is associated with the health data, just as Freddie showed that there are times when detection and attribution studies are done, that even for extreme events, climate change is not the primary cause of that. And then finally, we need to estimate the extent to which any change could be attributable to climate change. So bringing this all together, which allows us to make robust statements about detection and attribution for health and what we can say about the number of people who are suffering and dying from climate change right now. As I mentioned, there will be a special issue of the Journal Health Affairs released next week on climate change and health. There will be a paper on that, on detection and attribution. I also want to mention that today is a great day to hold this event. Today is the launch of this year's Lancet Countdown, which has three primary messages. I think the press conference is going on right about now. That no country, whether rich or poor, is immune from the health risks of a changing climate. The COVID-19 pandemic and climate change represent converging crises, which need to be tackled together. And this kind of joined up response to converging crises can deliver wins for public health, for a sustainable economy, and for environmental protection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you for, for the interesting presentation and for giving us a, a bit of um, you know, the uh, kind of description of what is happening now in this field on uh, detection and attribution in in um, health studies. Uh, now it's time for to move to the next uh, speaker. Please, to the audience, please remember posting your questions in the in the Slido website, and uh, we will have the joint discussion uh, after Petra's presentation. Okay. So let me introduce first uh, Petra. Petra Minerop is an associate professor of law, international law, in the Durham Law School. A member of the Grand Center for Ethics and Law in the, in the Life Sciences. Her current work centers on issues related to climate emergency and international legal response to it. Petra has published widely on liability in international environmental law, uh, climate protection agreements, human rights law, the classification status of states under international law and on EU citizenship. Her inter current interdisciplinary research project focuses on climate change law, human rights law, and attribution science in close collaboration with Freddie Otto and Rupert Stuart Smith. She works on rethinking and applying legal concepts in the light of attribution science. So Petra, now your, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you for accepting the invitation for being here today. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you for organizing this event. It's a great event. I've really enjoyed uh, 
the talks of uh, Freddy and Christy, and I followed this with great interest. It's a great honor for me to be here today. I will now try to bring in a legal perspective of detection and attribution science. This is a brief overview of my talk. I will explain the potential of detection and attribution science for law. And this concerns especially how we establish causation in law. I will illustrate this with two uh, cases. So it's not just uh, um, written letters on my slides. So there will be some pictures as well. And both of these cases involve private actors. So these are not human rights rights-based claims where the defendant is the state, where the perspective is slightly different. And in a final step, I will introduce you to a new causal matrix for the legal analysis that allows us to better connect science and law in the climate change context. Now, detection and attribution science has a huge potential of bridging the gap between science and law. Its use could change litigation outcomes, but also improve legislation, and it could inform the implementation of the Paris Agreement, including the much needed um, formulation of the long-term national plans that achieve the ambitious goals that some states have now defined for uh, 2050. At the level of international law, the Paris Agreement supports the finding that states already acknowledge a causal link between increasing greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere and extreme weather events. Now, especially in Article 8, the importance of averting, minimizing and addressing loss and damage associated with the effects of climate change, including extreme weather events, is recognized. Now, this is, of course, a binding international treaty. In line with this general finding, courts have also discussed climate variability generally and have accepted in many instances that climate change increases the frequency of extreme weather events. But that does not always lead to successful outcomes for claimants. And it does not mean that courts also find a causal link between a concrete heat wave or excess death or increased mortality caused by the heat wave and the specific emitter. From a legal perspective, it is one task to establish causation between greenhouse gas emissions and an increasing frequency and severity of extreme events and attributing such an extreme event. Now, Generally, to establish a causal link between a factor and an event, most jurisdictions apply a counterfactual approach. So the common law uses the but-for test and the civil law tradition uses the conditio sine qua non test. Now for both tests, the question in court will be, had the event happened but for the factor? So if the answer to this question is no, then the factor qualifies as the cause of the event. In most jurisdictions, the conditio or but for test is then followed by a second step in which courts will eliminate unlikely factors from the causal chain. So the, the aim at the second stage is uh, to limit factors that could qualify as a cause. But we should also keep in mind that in situations where the test has not been satisfied, but the outcome would have been unjust. Courts have also assumed the freedom to apply normative correctives to attribute an event to a factor. So even in the situation where the causal test is not fulfilled. So this was instance, for instance, a case in asbestos litigation, as I'm sure you will be aware. And in many countries, legislation has also overcome the requirement of the strict causal analysis for situations in which a person controls a hazardous situation um, or undertakes hazardous activities. Now, this is my first example case. The case of Gloucester and Resources and the Minister for Planning is one example where a court found a causal link between a planned coal mine in this beautiful valley in New South Wales. The coal mine has not been permitted following the judgment. There are other examples where courts have prevented the opening, for instance, of new coal-fired power plants in Kenya and in South Africa. So this is not just something that occurs in the Northern Hemisphere. 
Now, in this case, the court held that all anthropogenic emissions contribute to climate change and that there is a causal link between the project's cumulative greenhouse gas emissions and climate change and its consequences. Therefore, the court found here a causal chain, starting with the additional emissions, increasing greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, more climate change and more impacts of climate change. Now, unlike some other courts, it did not matter here for the court that the estimated emissions of the project may represent only a small fraction of the global total amount of greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I would like to contrast this case with the case of LEA and RWE. That is the case that is currently pending in second instance before the Higher Court of Appeal in Ham in Germany. As you can see in this picture, just above the glacial lake Palkakocha in the Andes, there is a glacier that is receding as a consequence of climate change. And this risk that the already high water pressure in the glacial lake will be too much for the natural moraine, as you can see around the lake, uh, to, to hold this water pressure and the pipes, uh, you can see these black pipes there, they will be insufficient to reduce the pressure. Now, if flooding would occur, the city of Fuluras and with it the property of the claimant, the farmer Luia, would, would be flooded. And therefore, the claimant asked the biggest German energy provider to contribute pro rata uh, uh, to, to flood protection measures, to improve the measures. And this pro rata calculation is done in line with the historic contributions of the company to emissions globally. Now, in first instance, the court held that the contributions from RWE were indistinguishable from the multitude of many other contributions of all other emitters. So the classical drop in the ocean problem. And consequently, the conditio sine qua non test failed and the emissions of the company could not qualify as the cause for the flood risk. The flood risk would exist even in the absence of RWE's emissions, so the court. Now, the problem is, with that is that the increase in a risk can often only be attributed once the risk has materialized, because then the court could at least in theory apply normative correctives. However, it is very questionable if this exists in the climate change context. And furthermore, the idea is, of course, to act before it is too late. So the question is, how can we rethink the causal concept in law to account for findings of attribution science where it is possible to link a scientific, in a scientific model the increase of the risk to certain emitters, provided that these increases are above a threshold of significance. Now, it's also uh, worth to mention here that the Higher Court of Appeal in Ham has entered into the evidentiary stage, which is already, already a considerable step forward, given that this means the judges are convinced that the case is conclusively argued from a legal point in view of you. Now, <clears throat> how um, can we bring this together in a new causal matrix to make these causal analysis more predictable in court? Freddy and I have spent a few years now thinking about how we can improve the reception of attribution science in law and have developed a new matrix. Uh, for this new matrix, it is important to understand the definition of the elements that form the causal chain in law. So E stands here for the amount of emitted greenhouse gas emissions, T for the increase in global mean surface temperature, and IF are the impacts of a changing climate. So that is all events that belong to a certain class because they share common characteristics. And these events form what we call a distinctive causal field. And this could be, for instance, all summer heat waves in Europe. Against that background then, IS is the occurrence of a concrete climate change impact. And that could be the 2019 heat wave in Europe. And as we have seen so far, the difficulty is to extend the causal chain so that it includes uh, the IS, so the this, this specific event. 
Now, so far, our causal analysis, the counterfactual approach in core that I outlined um, earlier, is based on using two logical fundamentals, which are already borrowed from for formal logic. And these are necessity and sufficiency. We ask in this counterfactual inquiry, if a factor was a necessary or sufficient condition for an event, this is the but-for test. This does not allow us to identify factors that have contributed to an increase in risk, and form part of a set of conditions. To capture that situation, we need the fundamental of sustenance. Sustenance measures the capacity of the cause to protect or maintain the effect under structural changes in the model. Now, a full account of this matrix has been published in an article. Uh, Freddie and I have published this recently. I will just concentrate on the main features here. Our theoretical approach is based on the theory of the computer scientist and philosopher Judea Pearl, who has introduced this uh, new theory of causality that has really the potential to revolutionize our thinking of causation across disciplines and certainly at the intersection of law and attribution science. And as you can see, we use the factor of sustenance for the final step in our causal chain, for the attribution of IS to E. That is where the detection and attribution science can deliver the evidence that the law often does not acknowledge. So sustenance would allow us to translate the findings of attribution science into our legal analysis. And it is at the same level of logical fundamentals as a necessity and sufficiency. So this factor will enable us to mirror the findings of the science where a factor has not on its own caused the event, but has contributed to it. So it is part of a set of conditions, and that is the climate change situation. And I'm more than happy to discuss more details of this uh, matrix if there is an appetite for it, but I would like to conclude at this uh, stage now. Now, as we have uh, briefly discussed, the Paris Agreement acknowledges some aspects of the causal chain already. And courts have also in many instances already found a causal link between emission intensive infrastructure projects and increasing emissions and future climate impacts. But difficulties remain in establishing a causal link between individual em emitters and quantity of emissions and specific climate impacts. But our new causal matrix allows for a coherent causal explanation in the climate change context and possibly even beyond, and it captures the probabilistic increase in the risk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Petra. Excellent, excellent presentation. Very interesting and honestly completely new for me that although I've been working a bit on attribution study uh, in the last couple of years, I, I must say that I wasn't aware about these specific issues and when this applies to legal, legal, let's say, actions, etc. So very, very much, thank you very much for your, for this nice presentation. So um, yeah, maybe now we should move to the uh, Q&A uh, part of the, of the webinar. I've seen that some of you already posted some questions in Slido. Thanks a lot for, it looks like it's working well. Sorry that I see that the, the number of uh, words is a little bit limited, but uh, I, I, I honestly didn't know how to change it. So hope, hopefully for the next time, I, I will definitely take a look at this. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's start with the question. Let me share first the screen. So I hope you can see my screen now. Um, as, uh, as I said at the beginning, you can uh, uh, vote the questions and uh, these will, you know, jump in the, in the list. So we can, let's say, take the ones that are more interested to the audience. So uh, um, I see the first one that is to, for Freddie. Um, it is clear how we can um, attribute climate change in the model world. How do you do it for the observed events? I think it's more about how, I mean, more about the, ba the, the basics or the mechanism behind the attribution studies. Yeah, so, well, um, in the observations, we always have only um, the events that happen or the, um, the temperature increase that, that happens. And that is a result of 
more than one driver and it's never nothing is only happening because of climate change there's always a combination of of different drivers and so from purely looking at the observations alone we we can't do the attribution we can see trends and 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 of course these trends can be in line with our understanding of what climate change does but to do the attribution we need to use models and that can be statistical models based on observations but it, yeah and, and and in order to assess how confident we are and how much our results depend on how good the model is uh, we we have developed a best practice approach where we use a whole yeah a, a different methodologies to quantify um the the uncertainty in in our results but what we do is we do attribute observed events but what um, the the key thing is how do we define an observed event and that is what what Chris has also alluded to that is the most difficult part of an attribution study and also particularly relevant for the health so which aspect of the weather leads to the health impact which aspect of a heat wave actually kills people or it leads to increased mortality is it the it's probably not the one day maximum temperature record that you read in the press but it's um, depending on on who who the people are who are experiencing that heat wave whether they work outdoors or whether they are in well insulated homes it's uh, it's maybe five day average temperatures and and this this is what you get from the observations and how you characterize the event but this is also really where 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 all the things we that that Petra and Chris have also discussed come together because that is, um, yeah, that, that, that of course defines the outcome. When you define a heat wave as average summer temperatures, you will get a very different attribution result compared to looking at, um, at three day temperatures in just one city. I hope that answers the question. Excellent. I think uh, it was quite clear your your response. Thanks a lot, Freddy. Um, yeah, let's jump uh, to the next question. I think this one is for Chris. Does it make sense to talk about impact on deaths under no climate change since without, uh, I guess, industrial revolution population density, an initial health would have been much lower? Yeah, thank you, Eric, for the question. And it goes direct straight to how do we think about our baselines and working in collaboration with people like Freddie of how do we think about events, how do we think about changes. And so what I highlighted were taking advantage of where we can certainly move detection and attribution forward quite quickly because we've got lots of examples where diseases are changing their range, we've got heat waves. Uh, but overall, you have to think about where you're setting your baseline. So mostly we talk about excess mortality. I don't know what the excess mortality for COVID is outside the U.S., but in the U.S., the excess mortality from COVID is over 350,000 people. So there definitely are situations where you can say, based on, and Anna can talk about this more than I can, about how you look at heat waves, and because we don't have a death certificate that says somebody died from the heat wave, we look at excess deaths and you compare it to a baseline. And this all comes back to how do we think about our baselines in the context of our health systems change, our health changes, demography changes, urbanization changes. There's all kinds of factors that affect our health and our well being. And so we do have to establish a baseline because as we go forward, people who are funding, for example, adaptation work, want to know that those adaptations are effective. How do I know they're effective unless I can compare against what it was before? So it's a long rambling way of not particularly addressing this question directly, but saying it is really important for us to think about how we're going to put those baselines together understanding that the future will be very different. And at some point, somebody's gonna come back and say, why did you choose that baseline? And we have to have ways to say that it made sense because of these reasons. Excellent, Chris. Um, something that I would like to add to this, because I think it's something, a discussion that we 
we had in, in the past. And actually, um, because it's true that when we ran a, um, a, an attribution study, for example, on a heat related mortality, we kind of don't know exactly what was the, what would have been our susceptibility without being exposed previously to heat waves. I mean, basically, we don't know what, what would be the, our kind of adaptation status without having been, ex been uh, exposed to heat waves. So the problem is that, um, in a way, we have to think that in a, in a attribution study, we have to simplify the equation. It's, um, it's a matter of, of course, of limitations and a lot of caveats. But I think it's, uh, it's, uh, this is science. I mean, we don't have the truth of everything. But at least we can give some guidance with acknowledging the limitations that we we know. And of course, we don't have a machine in which we can just remove everything and get just the results that we know that are really actually due to climate change and anthropogenic climate change. But again, it's about how to convey, convey these messages, trying to be clear about the conclusions that we get in terms of, of numbers, knowing that, of course, there are limitations in all these methodologies. but still this all this evidence is relevant but as you said chris i think it's it's a matter of time that eventually we will come up with better models and better methodologies in the part of the EP studies in which we can better assess or try to remove all this this noise behind that provide better let's say or more reliable conclusions excellent thanks a lot um uh, eric i think it was an excellent question um let's see let's see the next one it's for another one for freddie is it clear how we can attribute? No, this is the one that you said already, I think. Yeah, I see another one here. How confident are we that we can disentangle the various environmental stressors in a health impacts assessment? The total attributable deaths to PM, ozone, temperature, climate change that may overlap. I think, well, maybe, Freddie, you can continue on this. I think it's uh, based on what we have been discussing right now. I think Chris can probably answer that better than, than I can because, um, well, I can, yeah, if we, because I think we can, we can disentangle these different drivers like ozone or temperature and natural temperature changes maybe through land use changes also as well from climate change. But um, of course, w which of them then really lead to death? If we can't connect that very clearly to a climate variable, is tricky. So I guess you can just estimate, but Chris will probably know more. <laughs> I'll step back for a minute. And I don't know if you remember, Freddie, the IPCC meeting on detection and attribution all those years ago in Geneva. But this was uh, detection and attribution, the way it's evolved recently, has had significant input from from health researchers in that the answer to that question is stock and trade of what we do in health. I mentioned that briefly when you think about tobacco smoke when you, or think about cardiovascular disease. What are all the drivers of cardiovascular disease? And when you have sufficient research investment, you can start saying what proportion of cardiovascular disease at the population level is due to tobacco smoke, what is due to increased blood pressure, what's due to high cholesterol. And so we have equations that do exactly that. We need to have sufficient evidence. We need to have sufficient research investment. And that's a challenge that we have in this field is there's such little research investment that we haven't been able to do some of these analyses. But we, we do have the equations. We know exactly how to parse out these questions when we have sufficient information to put into our studies, right? So we, sorry, the information we put into our equations that we get from our studies. Anna, do you want to add to that? I mean, it's the kind of stuff that you do all the time as well. No, I think you, you clearly say what, what the, I mean, in a way it's a difficult question and I think it's a, and there's might not be a clear answer how to do it. And, of course, when we talk about environmental epidemiology, uh, we sometimes focus on one, two environmental stressors in our assessment, but we know that at the same time, there are other factors behind that we try to control for in our assessments, but it still is, 
is uh, it's very difficult to really find the, the the need effect or the independent effect of the of each, of each stressor, and especially when we uh, work on let's say in climate change epidemiology, that most of our our research is based on ecological studies. Still, this this let's say this part of the of the research is is much more complicated. So, um, but yeah, it's a, I would say that it's a field of work that hopefully in the, in the coming years we will improve and hopefully get better answers to all, to these questions as well. <laughs> I can add briefly to that of, it's also important to think of what are the consequences if you're wrong? Hmm. What if you underestimate a particular factor or overestimate a particular factor? And the overall purpose of our research ultimately is to protect human health and well-being. Mm -hmm. And if we're doing the best we can to do that, and if we do sensitivity analyses and say, well, if, if PM or ozone had a bigger impact than I estimated, what, what's the consequences in terms of protecting health, in terms of our investment, our human and financial resources, what difference would it make? And in many cases, when that's been done, it's like, well, you know, we don't have the numbers exactly right, but we have the theme. We understand the pathway. And this goes to another question that was uh, posted, is that we have really good information about what kinds of environmental exposures affect health. We don't have the details right. There's a lot more we need to know. For example, the impacts of, of heat on pregnant women, there's a lot more that needs to be understood. But we do have these causal pathways set up. So we've got a lot of confidence, just like the climate modelers have a lot of confidence in there's real understanding of how the weather and the climate system works. There are details we don't understand, and that's what we do research for. But as long as we have confidence that what we're saying will protect health, will not waste resources, I think we just need to move along with accepting we've got some levels of uncertainty. Exactly. Excellent. Um, well, let's move to the next uh, question. I think this one. Uh, this, uh, this one of Manuela. Um, is there any preliminary evidence about the COVID-19 pandemic impact on anthropogenic climate change? That is lockdowns. Maybe Freddie or... Chris, you have any uh, input about this? Well, I think just a, a well, there is a a little slowdown in uh, in the increase of <laughs> greenhouse gas emissions, but that does not change anything uh, in in terms of the trajectory we we are on uh, from 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 that point of view. I think what um, COVID and Chris alluded. Uh, to that uh, in her talk has shown us is really what it means when we have compounding risks and compounding uh, vulnerabilities. Um, I, I think this is this is fr from for climate um, for climate change and health, particularly what what we have uh, yeah experienced firsthand this year. That if you have to decide whether you let people get killed from a hurricane or get killed from a pandemic when you put them in a sports hall where you evacuate them. Um, that's very tough questions. And um, yeah, I think, I think realizing our own vulnerability and what vulnerability really means is the biggest lesson that we can learn from, from COVID. Okay. Um, sorry, but thank you, thank you, Freda. It's just because I'm trying to. I see. I saw a, a, a question in the in the chat for Petra, and um, yeah, maybe I can I can uh, do it. I can just say it in words to you, Petra. Um, how likely is this probabilistic sustained sense matrix to be accepted by actual courts? And is this different in the corporate courts that are part of free trade agreements? The, that last question was from Mike Joff of Imperial College, London. 
Yeah, thank you very much. That's a very good question. And of course, I mean, some courts are already far braver in um, assuming that we have a causal link along uh, these elements that form a causal chain. And that can be seen in the analysis of the higher court of appeal. So I'm not saying they are explicitly using our model, but they are finding that it is enough for a factor to contribute to the event because they assume that this case has been conclusively argued as a matter of law. And it's now the question of whether it can be proved that there is a causal link between these greenhouse gas emissions of RWE and the increase in the flood risk. So this is the question they are concentrating on at the moment. So from a legal perspective, that case will fly, so to speak, if this evidence can be brought to the court. And of course, what matters here is that we have um, evidence that is above the de minimis threshold. So not everyone who is driving a car uh, can be held to count for this, but um, that's different with a big energy company that has more emissions than many countries in the world. So um, to come back to your really good question, I think some courts are already doing it. And what we have tried to identify is how we can put this on a, on a more coherent logic basis, because there's no limitation of these causal analysis that prescribes us to only use two logical fundamentals. That is, um, that was never sufficient. And that is why in so many cases where courts have not found that there was a cause, uh, in cases of hypothetical uh, causation, for instance, courts have then said, well, there is condition sine qua non is not fulfilled, but it would be so unjust if now those who've suffered the injury should also carry the burden and the financial burden and have then adjusted their outcome in the absence of finding that there was a cause. So I think um, this is uh, perhaps less likely to happen because we don't have these normative correctives in climate change. But if we could base it on a more coherent causal analysis, uh, that could change uh, the outcome of cases. And some of them are already more positively painted, perhaps. And of course, you know, this whole analysis could also help to improve legislation. Yeah. So the implementation, the national plans, if we acknowledge that there are contributing causes, even if there are other factors that also play a role. Thank you. Excellent, Petra. Thanks a lot for your, for your reply. I think it was very clear. Um, I see another question here for Freddie and, and Chris. Has there been studies measuring personal exposure to climate change and health association? I'll start, Freddie, if you don't mind. Climate change occurs over decades and longer. The official definition of the World Meteorological Organization is 30 years, although some of the climate studies are now using 20 years as a definition of climate change. And it is then, your question goes to a life course analysis that as, as we age, we're gonna be experiencing very different weather patterns. And what does that mean across our life course? I think it's more interesting to step back and think about when you look at the shape of global mean surface temperature, there was a shift in the slope in around 1970, 1980, which means that everyone born after some time, let's say in the 1980s, has never experienced a normal climate. So my children have never experienced a normal climate. And that has lots of consequences. We're seeing lots of reports among young people around solastasia, around eco-anxiety, because they're in a time of constant change. They don't have a baseline that old people like me can go back to and think about. And it, there isn't a really good way to start thinking about how we're going to analyze that, how we're going to analyze what the consequences are for the heat waves that keep coming at us and are getting more severe, more frequent, uh, more extreme, and thinking about what that means for us individually with our health. And so there's this interesting challenge with the scale of looking at something that occurs over decades or longer versus us as an individual and how we experience that and what that, the, what that means for our health. Freddie, did you want to add something to that? I think that was a good answer. No, I've talked enough. 
<laughs> Thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks, Freddy. Um, yeah, let's move to the next question. I think it's split into two, uh, two different sections. Um, this is for Chris uh, uh, about heat waves in Japan. The event was 20% likely due to climate change, but you find it a bad choice to assess climate change deaths by taking 20%. What is that? To me, it seems suitable because with averaging over more events in the future, statistics would average out. Thank you. Thank you. It's a question for Anna and for me, that when you look at the association between temperature and mortality, that in each community, there is a temperature at which mortality is at a minimum. And as temperatures go up, there is generally a linear relationship between temperature and mortality. And when you start thinking about heat waves, you're moving further and further out in that relationship, which means the number of deaths are much higher when you have higher temperatures. And so if you say that there's a 20% likelihood, but there's been a complete shift in the temperature distribution, and so there could be a much bigger proportion of those deaths that you could say are due to climate change when you lay out the temperatures and think about where mortality occurs with respect to those temperatures. As I said before, I think this is a really important area where we need to have discussions in the health sector because we need to come up with a method or several methods that we're comfortable with that are consistent with our understanding of etiology and with the exposure response relationships that people are investing such effort into to be able to say, when you're looking at heat waves, then this is how I would estimate the proportion of deaths that could be attributable to climate change. Anna? I think you replied very well to, to the question. Eventually, is what you said that the, come up with a final, with a kind of you know, framework that can be used. And um, I would say not every, everywhere, but uh, at least to have something coherent that eventually we can compare estimate for different studies. That would be very, very, very useful. And I would say that we cannot ask this now because still i would say that there's just some a few studies on attribution of health studies that in a way it's completely a new field of work in this area and surely in the next in the next years there will be more and possibly the the option to to come up with something with a method that could be you know uh, coherent and more importantly what you said during your presentation that we should definitely align with climate scientists because these kind of studies in a way the output of these studies are very much dependent on this output obtained from the models. So we should clearly align with them, understand very well what we get out of these models and how we can, let's say, combine these data with our health data and our methods to get reliable estimates of, of um, impacts, which I would say that is very, is very tricky. Because I, I think that we sometimes speak in different languages, although we work on the same on the same topic. So um, yeah, well, thanks a lot for for your question, Yamin. Um, I think we have four or five minutes for a couple of questions more. If time, um, I see the first question: Is there any international fund to pay for damages attributed to climate change? For example, in cases that can be attributed to climate change but do not have a clear culprit. Petra, do you work on? I was going to say things? that's a question from Petra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So there are different funds that are occupied with helping countries that have. Sorry about that. That um, you know the Green Climate Fund, and uh, so there are different schemes. Uh, but what most countries really want to avoid is to open the floodgates, so to speak, for compensation claims, and that is why. Uh, these negotiations around um, how do we implement Article 8 on loss and damages are so very difficult. I mean, this has been seen especially by the developing countries in the negotiations as um, a clearinghouse for risk transfer. So it's not necessarily something that we would understand provides states with um, a legal basis to bring a claim that can then hold those who have emitted more historically 
uh, to hold them liable in court. So um, in, in that sense, there is no fund that generally uh, states uh, that are concerned by sea level rise. Um, but, and, and by others, really ex existential questions due to climate change can go to. So that doesn't um, exist um, um, at the moment. So this um, will be maybe an open point in the future negotiations. Uh, I think on the top of the agenda for COP26 are more the market mechanisms. Um, here, but uh, I, if, if I can just add one point um, in relation to the litigation aspect generally, I think we shouldn't forget that legislation is really a, a very important factor here as well. And, and also the health and uh, science, even if we can't link all elements, it will increase the pressure of defining the duty of care of states towards protecting our rights in a different way. So if we can uh, if we have more evidence on the health impacts of climate change that will be fundamental in saying well at the moment states are not doing enough uh, because we are not heading towards the right temperature goal and even if we are heading towards it we are not adapted to a changing climate well enough in all regions so i think it really matters for raising the bar for for states to protect so the, to to protect uh, human rights and fundamental rights Excellent. Thanks a lot, Petra. Now that you are talking, <laughs> I see here another another question that uh, I see that the audience has raised. Are there current claims on health impacts in courts? Well, um, not in relation to attribution science. So there hasn't really been a case just based on attribution science and health impacts, but there have been, um, there was the case in uh, Switzerland on Klimaseniorinnen. <laughs> climate seniors you know female climate seniors that would be the translation i think uh, yes well it was found that it's not sufficient to uh, differentiate between different groups so why is, is one group more effective than the other and that matters uh, yes for causation but also for legal standing so you can only bring a claim if you can um, um, establish and provide uh, the evidence uh, that you have um, been particularly affected and therefore you have the subjective right to bring a claim so much of this depends upon which kind of legal doctrine you are using to bring a claim so there are you know a variety of approaches and um, there are over 800 cases around the world in climate change so there are many different strategies that are tested and then changed in accordance to outcome of cases but there have been cases that have been um based on, on um, Article 2 and Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And now we have this very latest case, the case of the uh, Portuguese um, um, uh, families, that, or not families, but um, uh, young people, I think, bringing this claim to the Strasbourg Court. And that is under Article 3 of the Convention, whether you know, climate change and allowing it to this extent amounts to inhumane treatment. Um, and uh, another case in Pakistan has also acknowledged in the Gari that there is a link between climate change and uh, and health impact so but these are cases that don't link a specific health impact so not the excess death in a particular area to climate change so that is really the crucial and difficult point excellent Petra thanks a lot for for the reply and um, yeah I think it's already time for for wrapping up, I think um, I mean we 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 had uh, I would say a, a, an excellent webinar with a very nice presentation, a very nice discussion. I think it's clear from what we have heard today is that uh, the attribution studies in the, in the health field is something that is very much of interest and very much needed. And possibly in the next in the next uh, years, we should definitely have to to address this research question more deeply in our community in climate change epidemiology and um, and in a way I think uh, it's really nice to see that uh, eventually this is a clear option or uh, opportunity for collaboration with different uh, uh, in between the areas and and researchers from different with different background and expertise in this case to co collaborate with climate experts with people working in law and eventually we can see that the conclusion that we can derive from this from these studies can be very very much of interest for our for our let's say um for pu public uh, for public health and possibly you know for the the let's say for the coming generations 
So, well, again, thanks a lot for, for participating in this, um, in this webinar today to the speakers and all the audience. I think it was very nice. And again, I really appreciate the, the response and hopefully we will organize something soon as a follow-up. Thank you very much again. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.